two worlds. I begin my story with an event from the time when I was ten years old, attending the local grammar school in our small country town. I can still catch the fragrance of many things which stir me with feelings of melancholy and send delicious shivers of delight through me. Dark and sunlit streets, houses and towers, clock chimes and people's faces, rooms full of comfort and warm hospitality, rooms full of secret and profound ghostly fears. It is a world that savours of warm corners, rabbits, servant girls, household remedies and dried fruit. It was the meeting place of two worlds. Day and night came thither from two opposite poles. There was a world of my parents' house, or rather it was even more circumscribed and embraced only my parents themselves. This world was familiar to me in almost every aspect. It meant mother and father, love and severity, model behaviour in school. It was a world of quiet brilliance, clarity and cleanliness. In it, gentle and friendly conversation, washed hands, clean clothes and good manners were the order of the day. In this world, the morning hymn was sung, Christmas celebrated. Through it ran straight lines and paths that led into the future. Here were duty and guilt, bad conscience and confessions, forgiveness and good resolutions, love and reverence, wisdom and Bible readings. In this world, you had to conduct yourself so that life should be pure, unsullied, beautiful and well-ordered. The other world, however, also began in the middle of our own house and was completely different. It smelled different, spoke a different language, made different claims and promises. This second world was peopled with servant girls and workmen, ghost stories and scandalous rumours, a gay tide of monstrous, intriguing, frightful, mysterious things. It included the slaughterhouse and the prison, drunken and scolding women, cows in labour, fondered horses, tales of housebreaking, murder and suicide. All these attractive and hideous, wild and cruel things were on every side. In the next street, the neighbouring house, policemen and trams moved about in it, drunkards beat their wives, bunches of young women poured out of the factories in the evening, old women could put a spell on you and make you ill, thieves lived in the wood, Incendiaries were caught by mountain gendarmes. Everywhere you could smell this vigorous second world. Everywhere, that is, except in our house, where my mother and father lived. There it was all goodness. It was wonderful to be living in a house in a reign of peace, order, tranquility, duty and good conscience, forgiveness and love. But it was no less wonderful to know there was the other, the loud and shrill, sullen and violent world, from which you could dart back to your mother in one leap. The old thing about it was that these worlds should border on each other so closely. When, for example, our servant Lena sat by the door in her living room at evening prayers and joined in the hymn in her clear voice, her freshly washed hands folded on her smooth down pinafore, she belonged wholly and utterly to mother and father, to us, the world of light and righteousness. But when in the kitchen or woodshed, immediately afterwards, she told me the story of the little headless man or started bickering with her neighbours in the little butcher's shop, she became a different person, belonged to another world and was veiled in mystery. And it was the same with everybody, most of all with myself. Doubtless, I was part of the world of light and righteousness, as the child of my parents. But wherever I listened or directed my gaze, I found the other thing, and I lived half in the other world, although it was often strangely alien to me, and I inevitably suffered from panic and a bad conscience. Indeed, at times I preferred life in the forbidden world, and my return to the world of light, necessary and worthy though it might be, was often almost like a return to something less attractive, something both more drab and tedious. I was often conscious that my destiny in life was to become like my father and mother, pure, righteous and disciplined. But that was a long way ahead. First one had to sit studying at school, do tests and examinations, and the way I was let through and past the other dark world and it was not impossible that one might remain permanently in it. I had read, with passionate interest, stories of prodigal sons to whom this had happened. There was always the return to their father and the path of righteousness that was so fine and redeeming that I felt convinced that this was alone the right, good, worthy thing. And yet I found the part of the story which was played among the wicked and lost souls far more alluring. If it had been permissible to speak out or confess, I should have admitted that it often seemed a shame to me that the prodigal son 
should atone and be found again. Though this feeling was only vaguely present, deep down within me like a presentment or possibility. When I pictured the devil to myself, I found no difficulty in visualizing him in the street below, disguised or undisguised, or at the fair or in a tavern, but never at home. My sisters belonged likewise to the world of light. It often seemed to me that they were closer in temperament to father and mother, better and more refined and with fewer faults than I. Of course they had their defects and their vagaries, but these did not appear to me to go very deep. It was not as with me, whose contact with evil could become so oppressive and painful, and to whom the dark world lay so much closer. My sisters, like my parents, were to be spared and respected, and if one quarrelled with them, one always felt in the wrong afterwards, as if one were the instigator, who must crave forgiveness. For in offending my sisters, I was offending my parents, which made me guilty of a breach of good conduct. There were secrets that I would have been less reluctant to tell the most reprobate street urchin than my sister. On good days, when everything seemed light and my conscience in good order, I enjoyed playing with them, being good and kind to them, and seeing myself sharing their aura of nobility. It was like a foretaste of being an angel. That was the highest thing we could conceive of, and we thought it would be sweet and wonderful to be angels, surrounded with sweet music and fragrance, reminiscent of Christmas and happiness. How rarely did such hours and days come along. I would often be engaged in some harmless and authorised game, which became too exciting and vigorous for my sisters, and led to squabbles and misery. And when I lost my temper, I was terrible, and did and said things that seemed so depraved to me that they seared my heart, even as I was in the act of doing and saying them. These occasions were followed by gloomy hours of sorrow and penitence, and the painful moment when I begged forgiveness, and then, once again, a beam of light, a tranquil, grateful, unclouded goodness for hours, or moments, as the case might be. I attended the local grammar school, and the head forester's son were in my class, and sometimes joined me. They were wild fellows, yet they belonged to the respectable world. But I also had close relations with neighbours' sons, village lads on whom we normally looked down, it is with one of these that my story begins. One half holiday, I was little more than ten years old. I was playing around with two boys from the neighbourhood. A bigger boy joined us, a rough, burly lad of about thirteen from the village school, the tailor's son. His father drank and the whole family had a bad name. I knew Franz Cromer well. I went about in fear of him so that I felt very uneasy when he came along. He had already acquired grown-up ways and imitated the walk and speech of the young factory workers. With him as ringleader, we climbed down the river bank near the bridge and hid ourselves away from the world under the first arch. The narrow strip between the vaulted bridge and the lazily flowing river consisted of nothing but general rubbish and broken pots, tangles of rusty barbed wire and similar jets. Occasionally we came across things we could make use of, we had to comb these stretches of bank under Franz Cromer's orders and show him our discoveries. These he either kept himself or threw into the water. We were told to notice whether there were any items made of lead, brass or tin. He retained these together with an old comb made of horn. I was very uncomfortable in his presence, not because I knew my father would forbid this relationship, but out of fear of Franz himself. But I was grateful for being included and treated like the others. He gave the orders and we obeyed as if it was an old custom, although it was my first time. At length, we sat down on the ground. Franz spat into the water and looked like a grown-up. He spat through a gap between his teeth and scored a hit wherever he aimed. A conversation started, and the boys boasted about their grand deeds and beastly tricks. I remained silent, and he had fear to offend by my silence and incur Cromer's wrath. Both my comrades had made up to him, and avoided me from the start. I was a stranger among them, and felt that my clothes and manners were taken as a kind of challenge. Franz could not possibly have any love for me, a grammar school boy and a gentleman's son, and I was in no doubt that the other two, if it came to it, would disown and desert me. Finally, out of sheer nervousness, I began to talk. I have ended a long story of robbery, in which I featured as the hero. One night in the corner by the mill, a friend and I had stolen a whole sack full of apples. Not just ordinary apples, but pippins. Golden pippins of the best kind of that. 
I was taking refuge in my story from the dangers of the moment, and found no difficulty in inventing and relating it. In order not to drive too soon and perhaps become involved in something worse, I gave full rein to my narrative powers. One of us, I reported, had always stood guard while the other sat in the tree and chucked the apples down, and the sack had got so heavy that in the end we had to open it and leave half behind, but we came back half an hour later and fetched them too. I hoped for some applause at the end of my story. I had warmed up to the narrative at last, carried away by my own eloquence. The two smaller boys were silent, waiting, but Franz Cromer gave me a penetrating look through his narrowed eyes. "'Is that yarn true?' he asked in a menacing tone. "'Yes,' I said. "'Really and truly?' "'Yes, really and truly,' I asserted defiantly while I choked inwardly with fear. Can you swear to it? I was very afraid, but I said yes without hesitation. Hand on your heart? Hand on my heart. Right then, he said, and turned away. I thought this was all very satisfactory, and I was glad when he got up and turned to go home. When we were on the bridge, I ventured timidly that I must go home. No desperate hurry, Franz laughed. We go the same way. He sauntered along slowly, and I did not dare to go ahead. But he was, in fact, going in the direction of our house. When we arrived, then I saw our front door, and the fat door knocker, the sun in the windows and the curtains in my mother's room. I breathed this sigh of relief. Back home. Ah, oh, good blessed home, coming back to the world of light and peace. When I'd quickly opened the door and slipped and ready to slam it behind me, Franz Cromer edged in too. In the cool, gloomy paved passage, which was lit solely from the courtyard, he stood close to me and said in a low voice, No hurry, you. I looked at him terrified. His grip on my arm was like a vice. I tried to guess what was going on in his mind, and whether he was going to do me some mischief. If I were to let out a loud and vigorous shriek, would someone above be quick enough to save me? But I gave up the idea. What is it? I asked. What do you want? Oh, nothing much. I merely wanted to ask you something. The others needn't hear. Well, what do you want me to tell you? I must go up, you know. I suppose you know who owns the orchard by the corner mill. No, I don't. The miller, I think. Franz put his arm round me and drawn me close to him, so that I couldn't avoid looking into his face at close range. He had an evil gleam in his eyes and he gave an ugly laugh. His face was full of cruelty and sense of power. Yes, kid, I can tell you who owns the orchard. I've known for a long time that people have been stealing apples, and I also know that the man in question said he would give two marks to anyone who could tell him who stole the fruit. Heavens, I exclaimed, but you wouldn't let on to him. I felt that it would be futile to appeal to his sense of honour. He belonged to the other world. Betrayal was no crime as far as he was concerned. That much was clear to me. The people of the other world were not like us in these matters. Not let on? My dear fella, do you think I can mint my own money and produce a couple of marks out of a hat? I'm poor. I've no rich father like you, and if I can earn two marks, I've got to earn them. He might even give me more. He suddenly left me. Our house passage no longer smelled of peace and safety. The world was tumbling about my ears. He would denounce me as a criminal. They would inform my father. Perhaps the police would come. All the horror of chaos threatened me. The outlook for me was horrible and dangerous. The fact that I had not committed a theft was a mere detail. I would sworn that I had. God in heaven. Tears welled in my eyes. I felt that I should have to buy myself out and I groped desperately. Not an apple, not a penknife. Nothing. Then I remembered my watch. It was a silver watch, but it did not go. I just wore it like that. It came to me from my grandmother. I quickly drew it out. Cromer, I said, you mustn't tell. It'd be a beastly thing to do. Look, I'll give you my watch. Unluckily, it's the only thing I have, but you can have it. It's made of silver, I added nervously. It's good workmanship, and it's only got some slight defect, which can easily be put right. He smiled and took the watch in his large hand. I looked at the hand and felt how rough and hostile it was towards me and how it was trying to tighten its grip on my life and peace of mind. It's silver, I repeated nervously. 
I don't give a damn for your silver and your old watch, he said with withering scorn. Get it repaired yourself. But Franz, I exclaimed, trembling with fear lest he walk off. Just wait a moment. Take the watch. It really is made of silver, honestly, and I haven't got anything else. He gave me a cold, scornful look. Well, you know who I'm going to see. Or I might even inform the police. The sergeant is a friend of mine. He turned as if to go. I held him back by his coat sleeve. He must not go. I would much rather die than have to suffer what would happen if he went off like that. France, I implored, hot with emotion. Don't do anything stupid. It is a joke, isn't it? It's a joke, all right, but it might be an expensive one for you. Just tell me, Franz, what I am to do, and I'll do whatever you like. His eyes narrowed, and he laughed again. Don't be a fool, he said with false good humour. You know as well as I do. I can earn two marks, and I'm not rich. You know I can't afford to chuck them away. But you're rich. You've got a watch. You've only got to give me two marks, and everything will be all right. I grasped his logic. But two marks... It was far away beyond my means and as unattainable as ten, a hundred, a thousand marks. I did not have any money. There was a money box which mother kept for me, and it contained a few ten and five penny pieces put in by uncles when they came to visit us and by other family friends on similar occasions. Apart from that, I had nothing. I was not given any pocket money at that age. I haven't got anything, honestly, I said gloomily. I haven't any money, but I'll give you anything else. I've got a book about Indians and soldiers and a compass. I'll fetch it for you. Cromer merely contracted his lips in an evil sneer and spat on the ground. Talk sense, he commanded. You can keep your stupid rubbish. A compass. Don't make me angry, do you hear? And hand over the money. But I haven't any. They don't give me any. I can't do anything about it. Bring me two marks tomorrow morning, then. I'll wait for him downstairs after school. See you have them ready or you'll find out what happens if you don't. Yes, but where am I going to get them from, when I haven't got any? There's plenty of money in your house. That's up to you. Tomorrow after school, then. And I tell you, if you don't bring it... He flashed an intimidating glance at me, spat again, and vanished like a shadow. I felt unable to go upstairs. My life was wrecked. I thought vaguely of running away and never returning, or of drowning myself. I sat down in the dark on the bottom step of our outside staircase, withdrew into myself, and abandoned myself to my misery. Lena found me there, weeping, when she came down with a basket to collect some firewood. I begged her to say nothing about it, and went upstairs. On the right of the glazed door hung father's hat and mother's sunshade. An atmosphere of homeliness and affection hung about all these things. My heart warmed to them gratefully as that of the prodigal son must have done, when he was confronted with the sight and smell of the old familiar rooms of his house. But none of this was mine any longer. It all belonged to the world of my parents, and I was deeply and guiltily engulfed in the alien tide. I was involved in excitement and wrongdoing, threatened by the enemy, beset by dangers, fear and scandal. The hat and the sunshade, the good old sandstone floor, the large picture of the whole cupboard, and the voices of my elder sisters coming from the living room, it was all more moving and precious than ever, but it had ceased to be a comfort, and something I could rely on, and I had become a kind of reproach. This was no longer my world. I could have no part in its cheerfulness and peace. My feet were defiled. I could not wipe them on the mat. I was accompanied by shadows of which this world of home knew nothing. I'd had plenty of secrets, plenty of scares before, but it had all been light-hearted compared to what I was bringing back with me that day. Fate was tracking me down. Hands were reaching for me from which my mother could not protect me, of which she knew nothing. What my crime was, theft or lying, had I not sworn a false oath by God and everything that was sacred, did not come into it. My sin was not this or that. My sin was that I was in league with the devil. Why had I associated with him? Why had I listened to Cromer more than I had ever done to my father? Why had I lied about that theft, father myself a crime as if it had been a heroic deed? And now the devil held me in his clutches. The enemy was at my shoulder. For the time being, my fear was not of the next day. It was a horrible certainty that I was treading the downhill path that led into the darkness. I felt that my first lapse was bound to be followed by others, and that my presence among my brothers and sisters 
and my demonstrations of affection towards my parents were a lie, that I was living a fate and a lie that I was hiding from them. For a moment a flash of confidence and hope lit inside me as I stood looking at my father's hand. I would tell him the whole story. The judgment he passed and the punishment he meted out would make him into my confidant and saviour. It would only mean the kind of penance I had done often enough. A difficult and painful hour, a difficult and rueful request for forgiveness. How sweet it all sounded, how tempting it was, but it was no use. I knew that I would not do it. I knew that I now had a secret, a debt which I had to work out for myself. Perhaps I was at the parting of the ways. Perhaps from now on I would always belong to the wicked, depend on them, obey them, become one of their number. I'd played the man and hero, and now I must bear the consequences. I was glad that my father upbraided me about my muddy shoes. It sidestepped the issue. The graver sin passed unnoticed, and I got away with the reproach, which I secretly transferred to the other affair. In so doing, a strange new feeling lit up inside me, an unpleasant, ruthless feeling full of barbs. I felt superior to my father. For the moment I despised his ignorance. His reprimand about the muddy shoes seemed trivial. If you only knew, I thought, I felt like the criminal who is being tried for stealing a loaf of bread when he has confessed to a murder. It was an odious, hostile feeling, but it was strong, and it somehow fascinated me and took a firmer hold of me than any other aspect of my secret and my guilt. Perhaps, I thought, Cromer has already gone to the police and denounced me, and while I am being treated here as a small child, storms are gathering above my head. This was the all-important and permanent element in the whole experience as I have related it. It was the first crack in the sacrosanct person of my father. A first incision in the pillar on which my whole childhood's life had rested, but which every man must destroy before he can become his own true self. The real inner line of our fate consists of these experiences, which are hidden from other people. A gash or wound of this kind grows together again. It is healed and forgotten, but in the inner recesses of our minds it lives on and bleeds. I was so horrified by this new feeling that I would willingly have fallen on my father's feet and begged forgiveness. But you cannot crave forgiveness for anything fundamental, and a child is as deeply aware of that as any wise man. I felt the need to reflect on my problem and plan out my course for the next day. But I failed completely. It was as much as I could do the whole evening to try and acclimatise myself to the different atmosphere in our sitting room. Wall clock and table, Bible and mirror, bookshelf and pictures were likewise leaving me behind, and I had to gaze at them with a frozen heart as I saw my world, my good happy life, becoming a thing of the past and breaking away from me. There was no escaping the fact that new taproots held me firmly anchored in a dark and alien land. For the first time in my life I was tasting death, and death tastes bitter, for it is birth pangs, fear and dread, before some terrible renewal. I was relieved when at length I found myself in bed. Just before, as a final torment, I had been subjected to family prayers, and we had sung one of my favourite hymns. But I could not join in. Every note was gall and bitterness. Nor could I join in the prayers when my father pronounced the blessing, and when he ended, God keep us all. I felt rejected from the family circle. The grace of God was with him, but not with me. I went up, cold, and exhausted. When I'd lain in bed for a while in warmth and comfort, my heart once more returned back in fear and hovered in a panic round the events of the day. Mother had said her usual good night, her step still sounded in the room, her candle still glowed through a chink in the door. Now, I thought, she's coming back, she has guessed, and she will give me a good night kiss and question me sympathetically about it all and then I can cry and the lump in my throat will melt, and then I'll hug her and tell everything, and it will be all right again, and I shall be saved. After the chink in the door had become dark again, I listened for a while, feeling that it must and would happen. Then my mind went back to the incident, and I seemed to be looking my enemy in the face. I could see him clearly. He had screwed up one eye and his lips were twisted in a leer. And even as I watched, I was consumed by the inescapable truth, and he became bigger and uglier, and a fiendish glint lit up his eye. He stood close beside me until I fell asleep, 
But then I dreamed not of him and the day that was over, but that we were travelling in a boat, my parents, my sister and myself, and we were surrounded by the peaceful and heightened glow of a day's holiday. I woke up in the middle of the night still conscious of the aftertaste of that blessedness, and my sister's white summer dresses still shining in the sun, when I fell from paradise back into reality, and once more stood face to face with the enemy, with the evil eye. Next day, when mother came hurrying up and called out that it was late, and asked why I was still in bed, I must have looked ill, and when she asked if anything was the matter with me, I had a fit of vomiting. It was something gained. It was wonderful to be slightly ill and allowed to lie in bed and drink chamomile tea and listen to mother tidying up in the next room and Lena dealing with the butcher in the hall outside. The morning off from school was something magic and fairy-like. The sun played in the room, but it was not the same sun they shut out with the green curtains at school. But even that I could not enjoy today. It had a false ring about it. If I could only die. But... As on so many occasions, I was only slightly ill and nothing happened. It saved me from school, but not from Cromer who was waiting for me in the marketplace at eleven o'clock. And my mother's amiability brought me no comfort. It was heavy and distressing. I pretended to be asleep while I pondered over it all again. It was no use. I had to be at the market at eleven o'clock. So I got up quietly at ten and said that I was feeling better. It meant, as usual in such cases, that I am sorry to go to bed again or return to school in the afternoon. I said that I wanted to go to school. I'd made a plan. I could not go to Cromer empty-handed. I must get hold of the little money box that belonged to me. I knew there was not nearly enough money in it, but it was something, and I felt that something was better than nothing, and that Cromer at all costs must be appeased. I felt guilty when I crept into my mother's room in my stockinged feet and took my money box from her writing table but my conscience troubled me less than on the previous day. My heart beat so fast that I nearly suffocated, and the situation was not improved when I discovered on first examining it at the bottom of the staircase that the box was locked. But it was not difficult to force. It was merely a matter of breaking a thin tin plate grid. I felt terrible about breaking it. I was committing a theft. Before this, I had done nothing worse than pilfer lumps of sugar or fruit. But this was stealing although it was my own money. I realised defiantly that I was taking a step nearer to Cromer and his world, and that it was so easy to go down bit by bit. The devil might come for me now. There was no way back. I counted the money nervously. It had sounded so much in the box and was so painfully little in my hand. It came to sixty-five penny. I concealed the box on the ground floor, clasped the money in my hand, I left the house without passing through the gateway. I thought I heard somebody upstairs shouting after me, but I hurried away. There was still plenty of time. I crept off by roundabout ways, through the alleys of a transformed town under clouds such as I had never seen before, past houses which stared at me, and men who eyed me with suspicion. It occurred to me en route that one of my school friends had once found a floor in a cattle market, I wished I could pray that God might perform a miracle and allow me to make a similar find. But I'd forfeited the right to pray, and in any case it would not have mended the box. Franz Cromer spied me coming from a distance, but he sauntered slowly towards me, without appearing to notice me. When he was close, he beckoned me imperiously to follow him, and went quickly on down the Strohgasse and across the road, without once turning round until he finally stopped before a new building among the last houses. It had not yet been completed. The wall stood bare. There were no doors or windows. Cromer looked all around him and went in through the gap for the door, and I followed. He beckoned to me behind the wall and stretched out his hand. Have you got it? he asked coldly. I drew my clenched hand out of my pocket and emptied my money into his flat palm. He had counted it before the last five pfennig piece had rattled out. There's sixty-five pfennig here, he said, looking at me hard. Yes, I said nervously. That's all I have. I know it's not enough, but it's all I have. I didn't think you were such a fool, he reproved, almost mildly. Things should be done right and proper between men of honour. 
I won't take anything from you that isn't correct, see? Take your nickel coins back there. The other chap, you know who, doesn't try to beat me down. He pays up. But I haven't any more. It was my money box. That's your affair. But I won't upset you. You can still owe me one mark thirty-five. When shall I get it? Oh, you get it all right, Cromer. I can't quite say now. Perhaps I'll have some more money tomorrow or the day after. You realise that I can't breathe a word to my father about this. That's nothing to do with me. I'm not one to do you harm. I could have my money by midday, you know, and I'm poor. you got good clothes on and get better meals than me. But I won't say anything. I'm prepared to wait a bit. The day after tomorrow I'll give you a whistle at midday, and then you can settle with me. You know my whistle? He let me hear it, though I'd had heard it often enough. Yes, I said, I know it. He went off as if I had nothing to do with him. It had been a business transaction between us. Nothing more. I think Cromer's whistle would frighten me even today if I suddenly heard it. It seemed to me that I heard it repeatedly. There was no place, game, work or thought, which his whistle did not penetrate. The whistle which made me his slave and had become my fate. I frequently went into our small flower garden, of which I was very fond on those mild, colourful autumn afternoons, and a strange urge prompted me to return to some of the games of my earlier boyhood. I was playing the part of someone younger than myself, who was good, frank, innocent and secure. But in the midst of all this, always expected and yet horribly surprising and frightening, Cromer's whistle would sound from somewhere, interrupting my games and shattering my dreams. Then I had to go and follow my tormentor to odious places. Render him an account and let myself be pressed for payment. The whole affair had probably not lasted more than a few weeks, but to me they seemed years, an eternity. Only rarely was I able to produce an odd five-penny piece or a groschen stolen from the kitchen table when Lena had left the shopping basket there. Each time I received a reprimand from Cromer, who heaped scorn on my head. I was cheating him trying to do him out of his rightful property. I was robbing him, making him miserable. Rarely have I felt so distressed in my life, never more desperate or so much in someone else's clutches. No one inquired about the money box, which I had filled with counters and restored to its place. But the scandal might break over my head any day. I was even more frightened of my mother when she crept quietly up to me than of Cromer's strident whistle. Was she coming to ask about the box? As I had appeared before my persecutor without money, on many occasions, he began to find other means of torturing me. He made me work for him. He had to do various errands for his father, which I had to do for him. Or he required me to execute some difficult feat, hop for ten minutes on one leg, attach a scrap of paper to the overcoat of some passerby. These tortures continued many a night in my dreams, as I lay in the sweat of a nightmare. I began to feel ill. I kept having fits of sickness, I was easily chilled, but at night I sweated again. Mother suspected some hidden reason, and showed me a great deal of sympathetic solicitude, which only made me feel worse, since I could not respond to her confidence. One night she brought a piece of chocolate up to me when I was in bed. It was an echo of earlier years, when I had often been vouchsafed similar little treats at night, if I had been good. Now she stood there, holding out the chocolate. I felt so ill that I could only shake my head. She asked me what was the matter and stroked my hair. But I could only jerk out, No, no, I don't want anything. She deposited the chocolate on the bedside table and left me. When she tried to find out the reason for my behaviour next day, I pretended not to understand. On one occasion, she sent for the doctor who examined me and prescribed cold ablutions in the mornings. My condition at that time was a kind of delirium. I lived in the midst of the ordered peace of our house, nervous and tormented like a ghost, with no part in the life of the others, and rarely able to forget my troubles even for an hour. Towards my father, who was often irritated and called me to account, I was cold and uncommunicative. 